Yes, sir. Address that question. Mr. Chairman, the uh, part of the license renewal process for a five-year period, the individual, as a part of their ongoing CE training, would pick up that course um, requirements under their own cost, or if their employer has participation costs, they would participate, but it's really up to the individual employer uh, relationship. Uh, sometimes it's an individual, sometimes they might participate in, in ed continuing education plans. And Mr. Chairman, the second part of that question was, the, reason, thank you, the timing associated with completing the course, is this a two-hour course or a two-week course, or how do we think about the timing associated with it? The, the, there is no uh, timing requirement, I meaning 16 hours, 20 hours, it is to make sure that these courses are covered as a part of their over CE program. So there might be one course that covers multiple components of this requirement that would satisfy the requirements, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, any other questions? Members for Century Applied? Delegate Robinson? Yes, I just have a question. Um, there were a lot of no votes on this particular bill in the Senate, and I just wanted to know where they were coming from, or if somebody could elaborate possibly on why there were so many no votes on this bill. Mr. Chairman, not to cause harm to my own, but I think the, 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 the questions were in relation to costs. I you know, did follow public research, and it really is depending on whether the employer participates with any um, tuition reimbursement or other program as to whether or not they fund these. So in a lot of cases, the individual is a part of their own professional certification process. Other times, some systems do provide funding. But it, it frankly is not, it would not be something new because they currently have CE requirements as part of the relicensure process. So it is not a, a cost addition in these circumstances. I think the, the senator answered my question, but it would be safe to say this reflects existing practice already. Yes. All right. Any other questions by members? All right. The motion before us is to report um, Senate Bill 1117. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak in favor of an opposition that didn't have an opportunity during the subcommittee meeting? All right. All those in favor of reporting House by Senate Bill 1117, please record your vote on the electronic voting system. All, of, all those opposed to likewise. Clerk will close the roll. That bill reports 16th. Oh. 17th and nothing. Okay. Thank you, Senator. All right, uh, Delegate Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate Bill 1359, also Senator McPike's bill. Uh, requires each local school board to develop and implement a plan to test potable water from sources identified by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as high priority, giving priority in such testing plan to schools whose school building was constructed in whole or in part before 1986. The bill stipulates that if the result of any such test indicates a level of lead in the potable water that is at or above 20 parts per billion, School board shall develop, implement, and post on its website a plan to remediate the level of lead in the bottom of water to below 20 parts per billion and confirm such remediation by retesting the water. The recommendation from the subcommittee was to report on a 7 to 1 vote, and I would so move. All right, it's been moved and seconded to report Senate Bill 1359. Any member of the committee have a question? Delegate Lamont. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick question for the patron. I'm wondering where the 20 parts per billion came from. Is that a EPA standard or some other standard? Yeah, yes, it is, Mr. Chairman. It is uh, based on uh, the guidelines to, uh, it's a standard that draws a 250 milliliter draw. It is somewhat different from the municipal standard that you'll see that would cite a 15 parts per billion. Those tests are based on a one liter draw. So this is a testing standard that was developed specifically for this type of circumstance. Uh, delicate voting. This bill seems to be very similar, if not identical, to one that we heard in the House earlier this year. Um, I don't know if it was a uh, delicate course bill. Is this identical to that one? Uh, no, ma'am. In fact, we had some uh, considerable uh, subcommittee discussion on this. Um, the, the prior bill that the committee considered had a much wider range of reporting requirements that are not in this. This identifies solely those um, issues where they hit 20 parts per billion and above uh, to report and address those issues, um, which is um, a change to it. And again, remember this this bill is a um, 
planned development. It does not speak to the length of time of the implementation, but simply sets out the a framework for testing. Um, is to help us to confirm affirmatively or negatively whether we have lead uh, as a point source. Um, my background in, in public facilities on my day job, I thought frankly that the 200 or so buildings that I managed did not have a problem. But I couldn't professionally answer the question um, to the council I work for whether that was an affirmative yes or no. And so we, we actually trained our staff on how to draw the test, how to label it, how to send it out and identify the issues, which, which came back out of uh, this past year. We drew 560 samples of that. We found 25 elevated uh, that were in the several hundred parts per billion, and some were new facilities as well as old. I manage facilities that are anywhere from two years to 250 years old. Uh, and frankly, my expectation was that we would have a handful of very old buildings that would have a problem. The, the issue is that we have facilities, the municipal water supply has been tested for years based on the lead and copper rule of 1986. There's been a, a fairly rigorous testing standard. The issue is that the water supply enters the building is actually where the lead is introduced. And so it, prior to the last 15 years, lead was a higher component in the metallurgy used in pipes as well as in solder joints. So the lead is actually introduced once it gets into the, into the facilities. So we, you can't know until you test. And so this legislation requires that they develop the plan to test. It is agnostic right now in terms of the length of time. It simply says to develop the methodology. Our Virginia Department of Health has the technical expertise um, in terms of the three T's testing protocol um, to assist with it. So they already have staff that can support for technical answers on this which is why there's no physical impact as an existing resource to our schools. Delegate Lingo Felter. The Senator just spoke to my question. Okay. Uh, Delegate Boulevard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and really just a comment. It, this hadn't dawned on me what a real issue this was until it actually happened to the school where my two older kids uh, go, which is Robinson Secondary. That was built in 1971. And so it, it never really hit my radar screen. They did a, a test of it. Uh, and it was a drinking water fountain uh, that actually showed very high uh, levels of, of lead. It wasn't actually even the original material. It was somebody who replaced a pipe and didn't know what they were doing or didn't realize the ramifications. And it was a very good thing that they went ahead and, and caught that so they could replace it. So older buildings and, and newer buildings, but it's definitely a problem throughout. Right. Any other members have questions? On central pipe, I have one for you. Um, do you know what the cost is to the local school systems to develop this plan? And are they going to do it in conjunction with the Department of Health, or would they um, pull in a contractor to help them with this? It really would be based on the risk profile of the facilities as well as um, the staff level expertise. I'm talking to Virginia Department of Health, and they're saying that they're ready to support. The, if you go onto the um, uh, DEQ's website, they have an existing 3T's testing protocol, which actually gives them uh, the framework of how to draw and how to test. Um, what obviously we don't have is their facility types and the age and, and sort of profile of those facilities. That's where their local knowledge to develop the plan, they would develop the site-by-site -site assessment according to that plan. Um, we did it with in-house resources um, uh, with my own day job. Uh, we were able to pull samples for about $40 um, and do a, sort of a risk profile mitigation to identify it. So it can be done in fairly low risk. Um, some local municipal water sources will also assist with that. We talked to uh, the water company that we work with there, Virginia American Water. They assisted and actually did the school samples uh, for free. So there's certain opportunities to partner with local resources to, to mitigate any costs on this. Senator McPike, um, I guess the other question I had was uh, school buildings technically, I believe, are, are owned by the locality. Um, so the local government doesn't have any responsibility, just the school board related to this um, plan and testing? The, the school board would have the, the, the onus as the manager and the operator of the site. They, they provide the facilities maintenance. So the, the responsibility would be on the school board and, and school board. Um, staff to um, follow through. All right, um, Delegate Yost. 
I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if it's a question or more of a comment. I see what you're trying to do here, and I agree with what you're trying to do. I'm just concerned because you know, I look at my district in a rural area, probably 99% of the schools were built before 86, so I'm in the 40s. And, you know, you're, you put this information out there, I can see where, you know, a lot of parents might want to be sending their child to school or their kids to school until the situation is solved. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, there's a lot of concern I have because it's not like there's backup school areas or anything for these kids to go to. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, just to clarify, where you had an elevated issue, for instance, you would take that one fixture out of service. You wouldn't close down a school facility because it's not necessarily the entire school facility that would have an issue. Uh, further, where we had issue, we had to take actual individual fixtures out of service. We supplemented that with water bottles. We supplemented there's different low cost means to, to mitigate and um, do workarounds temporarily while you then replace the water fountain. And so that's what we did to mitigate. There was no shutdown and no impact to services itself for all those facilities that we found to be impacted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Speaking of the bill, I think that this is a very good bill. It's low cost and high benefit. I don't think anybody wants to learn that their children are are drinking out lead that is below above the minimum standards that we have set. It seems like um, this can be done in a very routinized manner where you're not taking down an entire system at the same time. So I'll be supporting the bill and I hope that uh, my colleagues will as well. All right. Any other questions? The motion um, on the bill is uh, 1359 is to report the bill. Any other questions from members of the committee? Anybody in the audience wish to speak in favor of opposition that didn't have an opportunity in subcommittee? All those in favor of reporting Senate Bill 1359, please record your vote on the electronic voting system. All those opposed, please do likewise. We'll close the roll. The bill reports 15 to 3. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Delegate Bell, you have one more, I think. And Mr. Chairman, Senate Bill 1475, Senator McClellan, uh, there are two line amendments. All right. Um, Brian, can you report the line amendments just to make sure everybody's clear? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. On page one of the engrossed bill, line 22, after the relationships, um, insert uh, missing semicolon. And the second amendment is on page one of the engrossed bill, line 25, after the stricken avoid, um, strike, prevent, and insert deter. All right, does everybody understand those amendments? Uh, Delegate Bell moves and Good. second. Um, Delegate Lamonian seconds those amendments. Um, all those in favor of adopting those line amendments to Senate Bill 1475, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, those amendments are adopted. Delegate Bell. Chairman, this bill makes changes to family life education curriculum guidelines and curriculum, including requiring family life education uh, curriculum guidelines to include instruction as appropriate for the age of the student and the value of family relationships and permitting the age-appropriate elements of effective and evidence-based programs on sexual violence that are required to be incorporated into any high school family life education curriculum offered by a local school division to include instruction that increases student awareness of the fact that consent is required before sexual activity. It was the recommendation of the subcommittee to report the bill as amended on an 8-0 vote. And I am assuming there's a motion and a second to report as amended Senate Bill 1475. Any members of the committee have any questions regarding this bill? Delegate Bell, is this bill similar to another bill we had? Mr. Chairman, it is uh, somewhat similar to a bill that Delegate Fillercorn had that passed through here. Uh, it is not identical, and, and there, although there are some similarities, uh, this bill is different in its uh, focus, worry, and approach to. Uh, I think the, the greatest similarity is that they both deal in, in uh, family life education. All right, any other questions? Anybody in the audience wish to speak in favor and opposition to the bill that didn't have an opportunity in subcommittee? 
All right, all those in favor of reporting Senate Bill 1475 as amended, please record your vote on the electronic voting system. All those opposed, opposed, please do likewise. The clerk will close the roll. That bill report 17 to nothing. Delegate Bell, is that it? Mr. Chairman, that is it. All right. Delegate Massey, you have the next subcommittee report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> let's start with uh, Senate Bill 838 by Senator Stanley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this bill is similar to uh, uh, Delegate Murphy's Bill HB 2041. But that bill did not come through this committee. That bill went through the HWI committee, and it was then uh, referred to the Committee on Appropriations. Uh, what Senate Bill 838 and House Bill 2041 do is it directs the community college system to establish a three-year TANF program uh, for needy families, a scholarship program uh, for our community colleges. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, this is just taking some of this TANF block grant money it's my understanding that there was not uh, any money in the Senate budget for this or in the House budget for this. Uh, so the uh, correct motion would be to report and refer the bill to the Committee on Appropriations, and I would so move. Thank you. There's a motion and a second to report and refer Senate Bill 838 to the Committee on Appropriations. Um, Delegate Massey, do I see on lines 40 through 42 what is uh, commonly referred to as the clause? Yes, sir, you do. All right, um, any member of the committee have any questions regarding this bill? Uh, Senator Stanley, did you want to address the, the legislation? Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's just nice to see you again. Uh, it's our last week, and I'm going to miss you guys. <laughs> I don't know if that'll help my bill at all, but uh, I do know. Uh, no, I, and this pilot program may be, you know, um, starting a conversation that next year we'll come back to an approach we'll probably take care of it as it's taking care of the rest of our bills that go there. But, uh, you know, this is for rural areas and, and, and urban areas and, and can help a lot of um, children that are at or below the poverty level break the cycle of poverty by, by getting them associate's degrees through our community college system. It's a great use of this money and uh, if it doesn't work this year, we'll be back next year and, uh, and make more of an argument and make sure I got something in the budget for it. So thank you for your consideration. I appreciate it. It's good to see a full committee. So, nice. Senator Stanley, it's always good to see you. Great to see you too, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman. All right. Delegate Lingenfeld. Better to be seen than viewed. Yeah. <laughs> Delegate King. I'm not there yet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And members, uh, I was on the subcommittee when this came up, and I just want to clarify the issue about the Appropriations Committee. I mean, uh, obviously, we don't have any bill that has that fiscal impact has to go upstairs for the few, but on the policy side of it, I don't think there was any disagreement among the members who uh, listened to this bill that this is a good public policy for us to use the tenant funds because it's actually authorized. It's not something that's a new program. It is actually authorized. It's, it's a very innovative way for us to try to help those students who really have no place else to turn to for, for funding for tuition and for them to be able to use this program that's already out there for them. The only concern that we have on the fiscal side is that even though there's no state funding allocated or, or outlays, because it's federal funding that comes to the state first, and then it, it kind of has to get managed by the state before it goes back out, I think that's the issue. issue. So it, I'm not sure what kind of budget amendment you need next year, but I don't believe that the testimony was that we need to have state funding. It's just that because state funding is involved in the conversations along with the federal funding, which the money is coming from, it does have to go upstairs. So I hope with that clarification next year, uh, if, if that's what ends up being next year, then I, I certainly, and I know many of my colleagues on the, on the other side of the aisle also agree that this is a really good idea for us to be able to support the policy measure, and hopefully we can figure out the financial aspect of it as well so we can really get this done next year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. All right. Any other members of the committee have any questions? <coughs> Anyone in the audience wish to speak in favor or opposition to the bill that didn't have an opportunity in the subcommittee? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. I'm Regina Hurt here on behalf of the Virginia Poverty Law Center. We are certainly very much in favor of this bill. Um, if for no other reason than the fact that it's proven that uh, in Virginia, graduates of occupational and technical degree or certificate programs at Virginia Community Colleges make an average of approximately 35700 within one year of graduation. That certainly would lift individuals out um, of poverty and make them above the federal poverty guidelines. So if for no other reason we think that this is certainly a very beneficial bill. Um, and also, those funds would then be coming back into the general economy of the Commonwealth of Virginia through individuals who are spending 
Lane, who are purchasing things, who are able to really purchase cars, purchase homes, etc. So we definitely believe that this bill not only would benefit those individuals who are receiving these funds, but also the Commonwealth of Virginia as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience that hasn't had a chance to speak? All right. The, the motion before us is to report and refer Senate Bill 838 to the Committee on Appropriations. All those in favor of reporting and referring the bill to the Committee on Appropriations, please record your vote on the electronic voting system. All those opposed, please do likewise. The clerk will close the roll. That bill reports and refers 16 to 2. Thank you, Senator. Good season. All right. Delegate Massey. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to skip over uh, Senate Bill 1234. Uh, Senator Dunham, she's on her way, and she would like to speak briefly about that bill. So let's skip over that one and move to uh, Senator Peterson's bill, Senate Bill 1376. And there are a couple of line amendments. I would like to ask Ryan to support the line amendments, and then I'll explain the bill with the line amendments, Mr. Chairman. All right, Ryan, can you report those for us, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm a Senate substitute, uh, line 42, after students, strike, comma, parents, comma. And then on line 43, after date, strike, comma, time, comma. All right. Chairman, I would move the uh, line amendments. Delegate Massey moves. Second. Second. Somebody seconded. Uh, those line amendments, everybody understand the amendments? All those in favor of adopting the line amendments to Senate Bill 1376, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? Those line amendments were adopted. Delegate Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, bill, this is the transparency bill that Senator Peterson's got in, just trying to give uh, the public, particularly students, uh, a notification of potential increases in undergraduate tuition or mandatory fees, notification of that, justification of that, and then a good idea of when the vote would happen uh, at the particular public institutions. The line amendments, Mr. Chairman, took out parents. So it says without providing students, it did used to say comma parents in the public. We took out parents. Parents are not, I mean, our universities don't have a lot of contact information for parents. As a parent of a university student, uh, I don't have even access to their grades without their permission. So um, this just says, as it now is, it would say without providing students and the public, uh, a projected range. Uh, so we felt that line amendment was appropriate. The second one we took out, Mr. Chairman, was uh, the specificity with respect to time. Uh, so that we took out time in the terms of the notice to, that they have to give. So they have to give notice of the date and location. Many of our uh, boards of visitors meet on multiple dates, Mr. Chairman, and they may intend to have a vote on one day, but it may slip over to the next day as you have the debate. So when you actually said time in there, it nailed it down to a specific time. We felt that was too, uh, just too restrictive. So that's what the bill does. It just gives notification to the public and to the students uh, of, a, of a potential increase in tuition and mandatory fees and gives them a really good idea of when that uh, vote is supposed to occur with our Board of Visitors. That's the recommend, recommendation of the subcommittee was? The recommendation of the subcommittee was to report the bill 7 to 1. I was the lone no vote, Mr. Chairman, and I was just trying to keep the bill off of the um, uh, uncontested calendar so everybody can get a good look at it because we didn't have a House campaign. Right. And I would, so I would motion. Move, yes, I would move to report the bill as amended. And, a second, and there's a second. Uh, the motion before us is to report um, as amended Senate Bill 1376. Um, uh, delegate Peterson, delegate, um, <coughs> former delegate, uh, current Senator Peterson, did you want to address the bill? I'm not going to stand in the way of the train. I'm just saying it's current form that matches on the word for a similar statute of the board, So Okay. Uh, delegate Lingenfelder. Just a question about notification. What is the manner of notification? Uh, I think in the current form, it would most likely be email. I, I don't know if we specified that or not, but that would almost certainly be the way it would be done. Mr. And it would also be posted on the website. Delegate Lincoln felt your question. So would, would, in fact, email and a website posting satisfy the requirement if this were to become law? Mr. Chairman? Delegate Massey. We had a robust uh, discussion on this issue in subcommittee, and Delegate Liam felt it was the uh, consensus of our four-year institutions that, yes, uh, posting it on the website and emailing the students at their email addresses would cover notice. Mr. Chairman, I'm not an attorney. 
the gentleman who's carrying the bill as an attorney, and I always worry about those three little words, cause of action. Uh, well, there is no cause of action here, so I'm not quite sure what... You know, in terms of notification, if I weren't properly notified and then the board went forward and voted the increase, and boom, next thing you know, I'm in court challenging the board's decision because they didn't properly notify. I, I wouldn't spend any money on legal fees for that case. Okay. Uh, there you have it. All right. The motion before us is to report as amended Senate Bill 1376. Anyone else in the, on the committee have a question? Anyone in the audience that didn't have an opportunity to speak in subcommittee wish to speak on the legislation? All those in favor of reporting as amended Senate Bill 1376, please report to vote on the electronic <coughs> system. All those opposed do likewise. And the clerk will close the roll. That bill reports 18 to 1. Thank you, Senator, Thank you. Senator Peterson. All right, Delegate Massey. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Let's uh, go next to Senator Reeves, uh, Senate Bill 1430. And uh, there is a substitute, Mr. Chairman. All right, there's a motion and a second to adopt the substitute for Senate Bill 1430. All those in favor of adopting the substitute, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, substitute to report. Delegate Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill is uh, in, in, in the existing code, Section 23-1-802. Our governing boards of each public institution, which includes our four years and our community colleges, have to give some education to uh, the appropriate staff members about uh, suicide prevention. Uh, what delegate, excuse me, what Senator Reeves' bill does, it says that they also, and, and it narrows it down, it says the boards of visit of each faculty are at public institution. That was the substitute, uh, which means only our 15 four-year schools have to give some, uh, 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 some counseling with respect to post-prevention services to students who've been affected by a suicide that's happened on the campus. Uh, so that's what the bill does. I, my four-year institutions are already doing this, Mr. Chairman, uh, so they were happy. Um, uh, the community colleges aren't quite the place to be doing this, so uh, they were excluded uh, from the bill. So that's the bill before us, Mr. Chairman. I would move to report the substitute, uh, uh, the Senate House substitute. All right, and so Mayor Speckham. All right, it's been moved and seconded to report Senate Bill 1430. As a substitute. Any member of the committee have any questions regarding the bill? Senator Reeves, did you want to address the committee? We appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, <clears throat> the delegate Master did a great job of kind of tailoring this thing down just a little bit more, but this came as a result, just so everybody knows, from a student at uh, UMW where I represent, and um, it wasn't handled in the, the best way the last time they had a suicide. We had students without housing because of where it happened and all these other things. We did find out that. And there wasn't really a system in place to address what happens after this kind of affects someone in the campus. And so uh, this student uh, wanted to do something about it, brought it to my attention, and, and uh, she gave testimony before all the other committees, but she had class this morning. So, uh, but I appreciate the time of the committee. All right, thank you, Senator Reeves. All right, any other questions by members of the committee? Anybody in the audience that hasn't had an opportunity to speak in subcommittee regarding uh, Senate Bill 1430? All right. If not, all those in favor of reporting the substitute for Senate Bill 1430, please record your vote on the electronic voting system. All those opposed, do likewise. The clerk will close the roll. That bill reports 17 to 2. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Delegate Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're down to the last bill, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate Bill 1234. Uh, as it's currently designed, our, uh, our dual enrollment classes, each one of our four-year institutions uh, can enter into an agreement uh, with uh, the community college system and specify which, uh, which credits would, would transfer from the community college to be their community college student or one of our high school students taking a community college. But those are individual agreements between our four years and each uh, uh, each. Uh, uh, Community college. Senator Donovan's bill expands that a little bit, so it's got the shell working with our higher ed institutions to try to develop a, a class, a set of uh, dual enrollment classes that uh, our community colleges can teach that will be accepted across the board in our four year uh, institutions. So that's what the bill does, Mr. Speaker, I mean, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, you, the, the meat of the bill is on lines 16 through 23, but there's also a chairman enactment clause, uh, lines 62 through 74, which gives um, a couple of years, gives them actually three years to get this program in place, and they have to come back to us within a year of July 1st, 2018, to give us an update. So this is the passport credit bill. That's what the bill, the substitute does, Mr. Chairman. And you move the substitute? I would move the substitute, Mr. Chairman. All right, so second. Uh, there's a motion and a second to adopt the substitute for Senate Bill 1234. All those in favor of adopting the substitute, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Uh, Delegate Lincoln, do you have a question on the substitute? I do. Um, <laughs> I, do. I do. All right. Delegate Lincoln, Okay, yeah. I'd like to. I'd like the patient, the patient would come forward. Thanks for the production. Thank you for letting us know you were on the way. Thank you. My patients appreciated a little bit of a conflict this morning, so thanks. Well, welcome to the world of conflict, right? Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chairman, I've got a couple of questions, so if you grant me some leave on this. All right, Delegate Lincoln. Um, Senator, what was the genesis of this idea? Where did this come from? The genesis of this idea was um, lots of conversations with parents that were complaining about a multitude of things. And one, one correction or clarification I'll make from Delegate Massey, this does not affect dual enrollment. At this point no, in time, sorry, it doesn't affect what? dual enrollment in high school. And so it's not inconceivable that down the line it may. But the idea was really to clarify the process between two years and four year schools. And a lot of parents had spoken to me, and I have had the personal experience of kids taking classes at our two year universities, and those classes are not universally accepted for gen ed credits. You often have to go on the four year university website, find out what they'll accept. But if you're somebody that's building towards your four year degree, you may not know where you're going. North Carolina has a universal articulation agreement. And so as I explored the, pro, you know, kind of looking at how Virginia embraces the, the decentralization of its four-year universities and, and the real character and value that that adds, this is a way to look at transparency for patients, reducing costs because you're not duplicating classes. Kids were taking what they thought were gen ed credits, ending up at a four-year school. They were not being recognized for those gen ed credits. And instead, they were being made elective credits. And so the kids had to retake classes, increase costs, and lost the opportunity to learn about things they didn't know in an elective environment. So this is a, this is a way for us to kind of um, break away. It's not intended to replace articulation agreements, and it's not intended to give a child or a, a, a student two years worth of credits. It's a way for them to piecemeal and maybe get English and history and then go away for their freshman year and be able to take some other things or a lighter load. Mr. Chairman. The concern that I have, um, and I'm glad that there is a delayed process in this because I think this is a bigger bite than people might realize. And so I'll, I'll just posit this and like to hear your response to it. My concern is um, you have institutions across Virginia, 15, I think, Delegate Massey made the four year, four year colleges. And this really does impact uh, not only what the community colleges are teaching, but also what we're going to see in the four years. So you're going to have to have a lot of articulation in this group, because I don't think you would want the unintended, con the, the unintended consequence of seeing the generalized standard, say in Spanish 1, dropped, such that when the individual enters a four year, is not prepared to do well in Spanish too. And so I think there's a tension in that. Um, and some community colleges may be doing it better than others. And so how's that thing going to float? You know, where's the standard going to wind up floating? And that's why I think you've got uh, some of the tension in the system now, which requires a student to, to actually go out and find out, quote, the level of difficulty, if you will. So, I mean, what's your response to that? So, Mr. Chairman and Delegate Lingenfelter, I agree with you completely. And that is exactly why this piece of legislation is constructed the way that it is. And that is that our, our institutions of higher learning are going to construct the core competencies 
and the outcome measures for these classes. This is not intended to take a class that already exists in a community college. This is an opportunity for the four-year schools to set the benchmarks of what they think is that high level quality. What will allow this child to accomplish the basic competencies we need them to get for our school, and you know we have really high functioning colleges here in Virginia, and that that then can be built on so that when they move into a 200 level class or a 300 level class, they're not at a deficit. And that's why we do have the one year reporting so that they can look at constructing that. This label of passport is not a given. It is a credential that is put on a, so in other words, we're going to design what the core competencies look at, then we're going to have the two-year institutions develop that class, and then it's going to get that credential of passport. But having that credential makes it a universal language that parents and students in four-year universities understand, but by no means is this meant to be a way to shortcut. In this year, when we've all witnessed the assault on our decentralized system with tuition costs and everything else, this is instead of an assault, a collaboration. I come from the world of medicine where autonomy is so hard to surrender, and I get that for these four years. I don't think I understand. I understand Sorry. Too. Mr. Chairman, final, final line. Oh, yeah. um, first of all, uh, I had a talk with General P this weekend. Apparently, we were like two ships passing in the night. Yes, sir. He had one discussion with you, and then he had a discussion with me, and then he had a discussion with you. And the discussion didn't, didn't get back to me, but so the committee will know my concern was about whether or not we should exempt VMI from this requirement. And just to give the committee some background on this, back in 2003 when the superintendent began um, looking at his long-range plan to for VMI not only for the academic piece but for the athletic piece and for the leadership piece in particular given its posture as a producer of leaders nationally. Um, he went through a, and the school went through a very, very complex uh, task of integrating and interleaving into their coursework some leadership requirements that quite frankly will not be the sorts of things that are easily replicated at the community college level. And the concern was how are you going to deal with that? Uh, VMI doesn't take a lot of uh, transfers by, nat by virtue of its nature, you know, in the cadet experience, and they do accept them uh, at one year. That's what the board has agreed to, um, and they can probably work around some of these issues there. But I would hope that in the process of looking at this between now and 2020, uh, that we will just ask ourselves plainly, what's the efficacy in this case? You know, where you have a very prescriptive um, and unique, in a sense, uh, curricula that you don't want to have an unintended consequence for. So I am not going to be offering that amendment to this bill at this time, but I want to say to the Senator that I'm concerned about it, and I will be following very closely uh, what Chef does with this, because I do not want to see us uh, put their core curriculum, particularly with the leadership aspects that they've interleaved into virtually every course they teach now, there at the Institute, that uh, we, we in fact might water that down. And that's not something I think you want. It's certain, I mean, you have a VMI connection as well. Yes, sir. And I have several of them. And so we just want to make sure that it's, it remains high quality. That's my point. All right, any other questions about members of the committee? Um, Delegate Massey, what was the recommendation of the subcommittee? The recommendation of the uh, subcommittee was to report the substitute on a vote of seven to one. Mr. Chairman, as I did for all the prior bills, I voted against it just to keep it off the uncontested calendar because I think it's an important bill. I tend to vote for it on the floor, but I will vote against it again. So I would move, move the substitute. Um, excuse me. I would recommend reporting the substitute, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. All right. There's a motion and a second. Second to report the substitute. Um, that's been properly seconded. Delegate Bagby. I did. Uh, I just wanted, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to check with Delegate uh, uh, Bassett to see if he wants me to vote against it so he can vote for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. You're welcome to do it. I'm going to vote for it on the floor. I'm just trying to, it's an important bill. I'm just trying to get everybody to keep everybody's will, taste back. I will as well, Mr. Chair. Just don't want you to have to Thank do that all the <laughs> I love company. All right. Anybody feel free to vote however they want to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um,
Senator, is there anything else you'd like to add about the legislation? No, sir. Thank you. Um, all right, any other members of the committee have any questions regarding the bill? Any member of the audience that hasn't spoken in subcommittee wish to address the legislation? All those in favor of reporting Senate Bill 1234 as a substitute, please record your vote on the electronic voting system. All those opposed do likewise. The clerk will close the roll. Um, the House bill, our Senate bill passes 18 to 2, and apparently our two members um, decided they didn't want to support it. So, all right. Delegate Massey, does that complete your? It does, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all my members of my higher education subcommittee. I thought we had a, a good year, and I want to thank staff, Ryan and Becky, consistently turned things around from a 4 o'clock uh, in the afternoon subcommittee meeting for a full committee meeting the next morning. So I think we did a lot of great work. I want to thank all my, and thank all my subcommittee members and thank staff. Before my meeting, and we adjourn, let me, um, let me add to that. Uh, I want to thank um, Becky and Claude especially for their work this year. Uh, they've done a great job keeping us straight and recording your votes. And uh, they will still be recording votes. <laughs> Brian and Tom, um, they have done a great job keeping up with all the changes you all make uh, on various legislation that we request, and, and uh, I know they do a great job. They deserve a round of applause as well. So. And then let me thank uh, each member of the committee, especially um, uh, your engagement in the subcommittees. That's worked out very well again this year. I want to thank the three subcommittee chairmen, uh, Delegate Bell, uh, Delegate Massey, and Delegate Gleason. Back. And I want to thank them, and they deserve a round of applause. Um, and we're going to have at least now. You know, all of us are up for election, uh, for re-election, so we don't know if we'll be here or not. But I know one member who will not be returning because he's decided to leave us. There, there are two ways to leave. Um, well, there are three ways to leave uh, <laughs> um, to service in the legislature. Um, but he is he's determined. Um, to uh, basically uh, uh, to leave, actually we have two members, I, I always uh, forget that they've chosen to leave, but Delegate Dudenheffer uh, is going to leave and, and uh, run for another office that he held before, so I want to congratulate him on that. I'm sure we'll look forward to working with him in that role. <laughs> and, um, and also Delegate Hester. Who has decided to run for another office as well? Um, and Delegate Hester and I get to work uh, very closely together on appropriations as well. We're going to miss her here and there, and in fact, um, all of her assignments. So we appreciate your work. And we, we wish them both well. Um, and then all of us um, hopefully will be returning next year that uh, the voters decide to refresh us. If, um, if they decide to do that or not. But I also want to conclude by saying I think you all have done a great job. You all work well together. And as I've said many times before, we try to approach education from the standpoint of a bipartisan manner, look out what's best for uh, the young people that uh, we're trying to serve uh, through our K-12 and higher education system. Then the last thing I'll note is this is the last meeting we will have in this building. This building has been here and been operating since 1975. I can first remember coming to this building when I was a student at VCU and actually came down and looked at um, committee meetings. I can remember coming into this room. It's changed a little bit since then. Uh, this building served the General Assembly well. Uh, this committee room has served us well. Um, but we will be moving to the Pocahontas building, and uh, you all will get a chance to see hopefully this week that the space is going to be a little different down there, but we'll make do, and then we'll see what arises uh, from the, um, the rubble of this building that will be taken down in the next uh, three or four years. Um, but uh, hopefully you've enjoyed your time in this building, um, but its time has come, and uh, we will uh, see a new building, and hopefully we'll be able to utilize that facility for those of us that return in the next couple of election cycles as well. With that, any other members have any uh, comments or anything um, to bring before the committee before we adjourn? I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Then move. There's a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? We're adjourned.